20. All right, you think we're there? We got it? Okay, yeah, just a little easier to hear back there. I know I've got a, a strong voice and we got a PA system, but uh, again, it'd be nice if that would uh, shut off. So we'll go uh, to Romans chapter 14 tonight. And uh, the message uh, title here is uh, Practicing Peace. We've looked at, uh, since again, Paul changed gears. Uh, back in chapter 12, he changed gears and he started uh, dealing with our lives, personal lives. I've, I've had people, you know, come to me and say, Pastor, you can't tell people how to live. And uh, I'll say to them, you know what? You're absolutely right. I can't tell you how to live, but you know what? God can. And God does. And God says as Christians, there's a way that we are supposed to live in this world. Not only when it comes to our own relationship with God, and that's what he started out with, that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. So he starts at home. Paul started at home. And like, we got to clean our own house before we clean other people's houses, right? You're saying, Pastor, are you offering to come clean my house? And then he talked about our relationship in the church. You know, we, we've got a, a, a variety of different people. A, a, any body of Christ, any local assembly, any local body of Christ is made up of different people. And you're saying, well, pastor, I'm glad you're admitting that because there are a lot of different people here. But when I say different, you know, I mean different in that, you know, we didn't all grow up in the same type of uh, home. Some of our homes were different than others. We had different traditions and customs. Uh, some of us may have grown up in the East Coast. Some of us may have grown up on the West Coast. Some of us may talk funny. But, you know, we're, we're all, we're different and we have different thoughts and ideas. And so Paul said, when you come together in the church, you know, you got to realize that you're good. And this is kind of what he's going to be talking about tonight. He says, you got to realize there are going to be some differences. There are going to be some things that are just different. And then he talked about our role and how we're to live and how we're to relate in society. You know, are we supposed to be, you know, rioting and, and, and protesting and doing all these things? How are we supposed to be in society? We're to live peaceably in society and uh, we're to be model citizens of, uh, and law-abiding citizens. And then our favorite subject is obedience to our government. The Bible says that we're to obey our government. Everyone is like biting a lemon, Amen especially the government that we have now. And, uh, but, but he talks about that. But now, starting last week, and in all of chapter 14, and this is an interesting thing, as I think about chapter 14 here in the book of Romans, I, I mentioned this last week, that these particular situations, these particular ones, and I called them days and diets, we're probably not going to ever get in an argument in our church, in Calvary Baptist Church, here today or tomorrow or any other day over days or diets. Uh, they were, the, 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 this group of Jews and Gentiles that had come together in the church, they had different ideas and different upbringings and different backgrounds. I mentioned last week that the Gentiles, they come out of deep, deep, dark paganism. And so anything that smelt like paganism or idolatry or anything like that, to them, that was an abomination. They, they wouldn't go any, anywhere near anything that reminded them of their old religion. And this is where they ended up arguing over the diet, over things that were sacrificed to idols. And uh, so again, as they were coming out of that paganism, growing up in that like this is taboo. You know that meat that you're buying in the market was sacrificed earlier that day to an idol? And, and the Jews were like, hey, you know what? We, what? What happened to it this morning? We don't really care about. We're buying it in the market. It, in itself, it's not evil. There's nothing wrong with this meat. It doesn't have, you know, demons in it or anything like that. It's just food. We're buying it. We weren't there when it was sacrificed. That's, and, and so this is what they were arguing over. And also holy days and things like that. that we, should the Jews, uh, should the Jews uh, follow, or should the Gentiles follow the, the customs of the Jews? And we find that throughout the Bible. I mean, throughout the Bible, we find that Paul constantly had to try to work out differences between Jew and Gentiles. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the, Jew, the Jewish custom of wearing head covering and, and the Gentiles, 
coming in and wondering, is this what we're supposed to do as well? And that's why Paul says we don't have that custom and don't be contentious about it. And he goes on about that. So all through the Bible, we find them trying, trying somehow to work out all of the differences that all of us have. And we all have differences, right? One amen, please. Amen. <laughs> we all have differences. So... Paul spends an entire chapter on the subject of days and diets. Again, we're not going to probably ever argue about days or diets. But the principles are things that we should learn, right? About getting along and understanding certain things when it comes to our Christianity. So we saw last week that there is, for the most part, nothing in particular that we might have to worry about today, again, but the principles. So the premise here is that we're not to offend a brother who has a conviction about a certain uncertain, and that's what I'm going to say, a certain uncertain practice. There are things that are clearly laid out in the Bible. There are things that are clearly laid out. And, you know, those are sin. That doesn't matter what your custom is. But there are some things in the Bible, and I don't want to say gray. You know, they're, they're gray areas. But they may be areas that, 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 that could be debatable or, 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 or open to subject or opinion or whatever it may be. And so these are the things that Paul here is saying that we should not worry about. We're not talking about outright blatant sin. And uh, so he says here that, that we are not to offend a brother who has a conviction about a certain uncertain practice. It is a, if it is an offense to them, then we are ob obliged or obligated to make sure we don't offend them, even though we may not see the problem with it. And that's what Paul goes on to say, as we'll see here. He said, listen, if, if, if eating meat is going to offend my brother, I'm not going to eat it. Whether I think it's right or wrong, if, if it's going to offend my brother, I am not going to eat it. But then he also says something as well. He says, if you're the one that has the conviction, don't force feed it on someone. Don't, don't discourage them by, you know, getting, getting you know, the... the the, the, the gauntlet out and judging and trying them and putting them to shame or whatever it may be or over being over critical uh, in a particular uh, issue, issue or subject. And it reminded me years ago, uh, we had a fellow, this wasn't in this church, it was in our previous church. A fellow came in, he was a first time visitor, and, uh, he was sitting through the service, and I think it was a fellowship, we had a fellowship afterwards, and so we stayed for the fellowship. And he asked somebody, he says, uh, I, he says that your pastor was preaching out of the King James Bible. And, and he said, and I noticed everybody else has a King James Bible. He says, he had an NIV. And he said, you know, why is everybody using a King James? Oh, I mean, this guy got out a stack of, you know, oh, Timothy's this thick. And, and he got his, he just he cornered this guy, and uh, this guy couldn't get out of the corner, and he, he literally lambasted this guy upside down, sideways, and then he called me over to get me in on the argument. And I, I'm, I'm going, well, I just said, it's not really something we're going to discuss tonight. If you would like to ever sometimes sit, sit down, I'll, I'll explain to you why we use the King James Bible, but uh, yeah, we, we just like it. You know, it, 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 you, anyways, you could tell this guy could not wait to get out of there. And he, he left, never came back, never saw him again. And, uh, you know, I, 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 when, I, when I use the King James, the King James Bible to me is a conviction. I'm not going to preach on that tonight. I will not use any other Bible. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily believe it's one of these little issues that, you know, we just shouldn't worry about. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but there are many things out there that we could use as examples. And so the bottom line here is that we all have differences, but no matter where you are on the scale of Christian piety and separation, the, Paul is saying here we're to seek peace. 
we're to seek peace. Because not all of us have arrived at the same place. Not all of us are on the same even scale of spiritual growth. Some of us have come from different churches that maybe you weren't ever taught things in the Bible. Uh, maybe uh, the church that you were going to really didn't, you know, talk too much about some things in the Bible or different things about separation or, or, or Christian living or whatever it may be. So, you know, we, when somebody walks in the door of our church or any church, you know, that, that, that is Bible-based, you know, you don't start pounding them with the Bible, you know, you're beating them with the Bible and saying, get, get, get right, you know. This, we, whether, you know, they're coming from an uh, evangelical or a neo-evangelical background or whoever, whatever they're coming from, you, you just say, well, you know, they may be using the wrong Bible, well, Lord willing, they'll start using the right Bible. And Lord, Lord willing, they'll get this right. Because you know what? None of us have got everything right in our Christian life, right? None of us are perfect. And um, we, are, we are especially, again, here in some of these, these little fringe issues here not to, uh, that aren't clearly spelled out in the Bible. We're not to uh, provoke. We're not to cause division. But rather, Paul says you are to seek peace because... Well, I'll get into it in a little bit because just churches sometimes, it, I've said this so many times, I'll probably keep saying it, it, it just, it, since I've been a Christian, it, it absolutely never ceases to amaze me how, how bitter Christians can become towards one another and angry. And, and it's like, wait a minute, we're on the same team. You know what I mean? We're not, and, and again, we're not talking about serious apostate issues. We're not talking about gospel issues. We're not talking about these fringe issues. I mean, we're talking about, you know, there, there, are, there is time to leave a church. There's reasons to leave a church and all of that. But we're not talking about that. We're just talking about differences and things like that. And unfortunately, Paul had to face it as well. He had to face problems in the church. Even these brand new fledgling churches were having problems with people who couldn't get over their differences. And uh, so let's uh, read our text here, Romans chapter 14. We're going to read verses 15 to 23. So we'll continue this evening as Paul continues in the subject of practicing peace. The Bible says in verse 15, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died let not then your good be evil spoken of for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may, look at this, edify another. For meat destroyeth not the works of God, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth, look at this, with offense. You see, Paul's saying here, those little things that you may not think are sin, if you're going to do those things with offense, like, I don't care what that person thinks, I'm going to do it just to spite them. Then the Bible says, then it becomes sin to you. Then it becomes wrong. So, he goes on to say in verse 21, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the things which he alloweth. And again in verse 23, And he that doubteth is because he eateth not, in, not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we continue here uh, looking at the practice of peace, uh, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would have his will and way. Uh, speak to our hearts as we look at this uh, issue tonight and so much here in this chapter dealing with two very specific things, diet and days. And so, Lord, uh, may we take these principles and apply them in our, in our church, in our lives, that uh, we would not be divided over things, Lord, that really uh, do not matter in eternity. And so may the Holy Spirit of God have his will and way. We'll thank you. We'll love you in Jesus' name. And amen. The first thing I want to notice here is the spirit of charity. And we find that in verse 15. He says, but 
if thy brother be grieved with meat. He says, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat. And look what this is saying. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So he says, first of all, if your brother is grieved by the meat that you're eating, if, you know, you've gone down to the market and you've bought that meat that was sacrificed to idols and you bring it back to the church and you start eating it or, you know, you invite them over for supper, you put that meat out on the table and the Bible says that the brother is grieved by it, he says you're not walking in love. You know what, folks, if you're going to invite a Jew over to supper, don't serve him pork. Amen? Don't do that. I, I remember we had a, we've had several, not here, but again in our previous minister, we had several uh, Muslims who were converted to Christ and they were going back to the Middle East to uh, try to evangelize. And boy, they need prayer, amen? But I, I know one in particular, he started talking about all the things that would offend a Muslim. He says, we don't even think about it. I remember, he said, you know, we normally sit, men, men will sit like this with their foot up like this, you know. And, and he says, if you do that, and the bottom of your foot is pointing towards someone in, 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 as a Muslim, he will find that offensive. You know, we, we, we said, what? He says, yeah, don't, don't ever, like, point the bottom of your foot at a Muslim. And uh, I never thought about that before, but they know not to do it. You never hand something to a Muslim with your left hand. That's, a, that's an offense. That's very offensive. You always use your right hand. And so, you know, we think about that. These things are offensive. You know, you wouldn't invite a, a Jew over and serve him pork. Uh, you wouldn't invite a Muslim over and do things that you know are going to offend him, especially if you're trying to win him to Christ. If you know that your, you know, your brother or your sister or someone, you know, maybe that's an offensive thing to them, you know, just say, again, don't, don't, don't be spiteful and say, you know what, I don't care what they think. We're going to do it anyways when they come over, <laughs> you know. And, and he says, if you're doing that, you're not acting in love. You know, if you love that person, if you truly love that person, you're not going to do something that's going to affect even if you don't think it's right or whether you think it's wrong, whether it's days or diets, whatever it may be. You know, you just don't, you don't do that. And that's what he's talking about. The clarity of, of the rights and the, the free conscience is set before us clearly here of every Christian. We have the right of conscience but Paul says that it, we can't use that free conscience as a stumbling block for other Christians. And, and uh, you know, we can't say, well, that's ridiculous fooey on them. Paul says we need to have a, a spirit of love. So in the spirit of love, if someone, if something, sorry, we are doing is an offense to our brother or our sister, in love or charity, we are to abstain from, from doing that. First of all, our consciences are, are not fallible. How many people have already figured that out? Our, our consciousness, our, our conscience, sorry, is not infallible, which means we can't trust our conscience. There's a lot of people, a lot of examples we can go to in the Bible about people that trusted their conscience and they ended up in shipwreck. There's a lot of people in this world that have trusted their conscience and ended up ruined. You know, sometimes our consciences can be deceitful. In fact, the Bible says that our heart is deceitful above all things, and who can know it? And we also must remember, this is not speaking of what is morally impure. This is speaking about what is ceremonially, ceremonially sorry, impure as well. So uh, things, as I mentioned, that are morally impure, certain things that the Bible makes very clear about. The, these aren't really what he's talking about. Again, sin is sin, right is right, and what the Bible defines or gives us principles towards is, is clearly something that we should follow. These are things of ceremonial, ceremonial impurity. So sin is sin no matter how we look at it. And we should use our freedom of conscience with responsibility. We should use our freedom of conscience with responsibility. There was a... And he said this, and you'll know immediately, at least I think you will, when I, when I say his... Uh, he said, I am... Or sorry, am I my brother's keeper? Who was that? Cain. Am I 
my brother's keeper. What's the answer to that question? Are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. We are absolutely and 100% our brother or sister's keeper. Now, we're here to be keepers of the peace. We're to keep the fire burning in them. We're to keep them growing in the Lord, keep ourselves from anything that would cause them to go astray. And that's how we are keepers of our brothers and sisters. God asked Cain a question in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Where is Abel? Where is your brother? And you know, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you looked around in our church and asked yourself, where is my brother? Where's my sister spiritually? Where are they? Because we, we should know, we should have an idea of where each and every one of us are spiritually. And we should know, and we should help them, and we should guide them, and we should be everything that we can be as we think about edifying the body of Christ. That's what we're to do, edify the body of Christ. And what did he end up doing? He killed his brother. He killed his brother. He failed. He failed because he did not concern himself with the well-being of his brother. Secondly, I want to look at our priority, uh, and we find that in uh, verses 16 and I think through 18 here. But letter A is, given, is given, giving sorry, the wrong view, giving the wrong view. And we find that in 14 verse 16, let not then good be evil spoken of. Let not then good be evil spoken of. What is Paul saying here? I'm glad you asked. He's saying let good be evil spoken of. The church, God's work, let it not be evil spoken of. In other words, you know, we can get so caught up in doing right and arguing and fighting about what is right and wrong, and then the church is going to get a bad rap in the community. People are going to say, why in the world would I want to join that? Get involved in that. You know, when they're bickering over little trivial things and they're fighting and, 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 and some would sit over in this side and some would sit over... The Jews, that's what they did. The Jews would sit on one side and the Gentiles would sit on the other side of the church and uh, they would be over there with all their differences, you know, and they just, they just couldn't get along. And, uh, you know, some of the things, that, uh, you know, in church that I've seen personally people, what they're fighting over and ridiculous things, they'll take a, 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 a molehill and they'll make a mountain out of it. I, what are you talking about? Why are you, and unfortunately we're letting the devil get in. And by the way, it's a community. You know what's a good testimony? You know what has been a great testimony? When I talk to people in the community and they say, man, you must be doing something there. I'd never seen so many cars in that parking lot. In, in, in the 40 years I've driven by this church building. And, and, and I said, I'm not doing anything. The Word of God is, amen. The Word of God is being preached. And I don't want to say for the first time here. Maybe it is, I don't know. But it's the Word of God, amen. And, and that's, a, that's a good testimony in the, it, where, where people are going to be speaking good of things. And so, so here, here are well-intentioned Christians most Christians that split churches or most Christians that, that, that can't get along in church over trivial little things, you know, uh, you know, uh, about, about I, I had one guy one time got all upset because we, we don't sing all the hymns sometimes or all the, all the verses in the hymns. I said to him, do you know that probably 70% of the hymns in all the hymn books don't have all the verses that were originally written by the author? And they're saying, What? I said, yeah, you look it up. Amazing Grace, it has more than any song. Like, if you look at the actual original writing, John Newton's song, it has more verses than we sing. And almost every one of them are the same way. If you look at the original song. So anyways, um, I, oh yeah, that, that's offensive to me. We don't sing all the verses. We don't sing, all, you know, if that's the reason why you don't kind of be in church, then you've got some problems. There's a problem. And um, 
you know, getting, getting concerned about these petty little things. There was a... I, I, I don't make this stuff up either. There was a church that split, a big church, hundreds of people, six, eight hundred people that split. I think I've mentioned this before, over which way the toilet paper comes off. Now, I'm pretty stubborn. I like the toilet paper, and all good people know the toilet paper comes off the front. Amen? But I'm not going to leave a church because somebody put the toilet paper off the back. Somebody else is going to say, well, that's the ridiculous way to put it over the front. I'm not kidding you. There's been a church split over which way the toilet paper comes the roll. Another church split because uh, they started arguing. And you get there. Don't ask them to show you, but just ask them. Amen? You know, what does a community think, you know? We, we, we had uh, a lot of Dutch reform in the Norwich area. And uh, the Norwich itself, I think, has only got about 500 people, but the biggest church there has about 1,500 people. Most of them are farmers. And they have split and split and split and split and split and split and diced and split. And, and there, there are little churches everywhere, little Dutch Reformed churches. They, oh, we left that group and we left that group and, and all this stuff. And I don't want to be here too much longer. But anyways, what are we doing? We're giving the wrong view. What the Bible says here, let not your good. All these people had good intentions. Everybody thinks they're doing good when they're splitting a church, when they're pulling people out of church, when they're, uh, you know, fighting this great cause and, and, and they're the ones that are standing up against the tyranny in the church. And, and again, I mentioned there's a right time to argue or, or, or certain things that, you know, may be issues that need to be dealt with when it comes to apostasy. And uh, again, failure to preach the word of God and all of those things. But... I mean, we're not talking about that. This isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about craziness. And again, it's too easy for liberty to degenerate into carnality and worldliness, and unfortunately, that's what happens. And we must give a good view to the Christian life, to the unsaved, and give them no occasion to speak against Christ's body. There's a widespread story uh, about C.H. Spurgeon. Most of us know about C.H. Spurgeon. And apparently, and again, this is a story, you hear it. I'm not going to say it's, it, it is absolutely true. But it was reported that Charles Spurgeon saw nothing wrong with smoking. So he, he smoked. And uh, nobody was going to tell him that there was anything wrong with that. He would have his stogies and... and uh, one day he was walking down the street and he walked by a tobacconist. Now, if you're British, you know what that is. That's a tobacco shop. And uh, that's where you bought all your tobacco. He was walking down the street and as he looked up into the store window, there was a big poster. And there he was, more than life-size picture of him with a big stogie hand out of his mouth. And it said, smoke the brand that smo Spurgeon smokes. And so he took his stogie out, he put it out, and, and apparently from that day forward, he never smoked again. Because he said, I'm giving the wrong impression about what Christianity is all about. He said, I didn't realize that my little pet thing here, if you will, call it a pet sin or whatever. He says, I didn't realize that it would affect people like this. And he gave it up. And uh, so we give the wrong view. And then we're also getting the wrong view. Getting the wrong view. And he says that in verses 17 and 18, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So the issues of the day, and again, what is the issues of the day here in Romans? It's days and diets. Holy days and diets, what we're eating. This is what they were fighting about. The issues of the day, the days and diets, did not really hit or touch the real issues, the really important issues, and that's salvation. Can you keep a day or can you eat a meat and still be right? Well, the answer is yes and no, according to your conscience, right? 
One side of the argument said you can do those things and be part of the kingdom of God. The other side said you, can, you, you, you can't do those things. The first said, sorry, you can't do those things. And the second side said you can do those things and be right in the kingdom of God. And Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not meat and drink. This isn't the issue. This isn't the issue. The issues are deeper than days and diets. When, 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 when the role is taken up with trivial issues like which way the toilet paper comes off the roll or whether Adam and Eve had a belly button or, or, or you know, is it okay to, to, to eat a certain thing or whatever it may be. We miss the real issues that should be taking priority. How's your walk with God? Are you living peaceably? And this is what Paul asks. He talks about righteousness, walking with God, walking holy. Are you, are you living peaceably? And do you have joy of the Holy Spirit? One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Amen? Some of us have a monopoly on misery. Amen? That's my gift, misery. I bring misery to everyone I... I'm not saying that myself. At least I hope I'm not. But misery, that's what, you know, it is misery, right? Misery. So, uh, we're, we're missing the point. The kingdom of God isn't those little trivial things. The kingdom of God is more, more than tea and coffee. It's more than tea and coffee. Brother Larry Owens, I, I don't know, I don't think, I imagine any of you know him. He was a missionary we supported in another church. And I used to love Brother Owens. Uh, he was a missionary down in Argentina. And uh, we had him stay in our house a few times. Uh, and uh, I think if Diane, Diane's got a good memory, she probably knows where I'm going with this. And uh, Brother Owens, you want a coffee? He'd say, no, 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 no. And he'd say it so, you know, casually. He'd say, no, 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 thanks, brother. But I give that up when I, would, when I got saved. Every time you asked him. And then he'd come three years later, and we'd forget. And he'd say, Brother Owens, you, you want to go down to Tim Hortons for a coffee? I said, no. He said, no, 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 no. No, no. He says, I gave that up when I got saved. I said, hey, man, well, if you don't drink coffee, praise the Lord for you. But I'm going to drink my coffee. <laughs> Amen. It's more than tea and coffee. Those things, you know, you can say uh, whatever you want there about, about those things. That's not what Paul's saying here. And... Uh, our, and then thirdly is our practice. We find that in verses 19 to 21. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, the things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the works of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man, and again, I, I kind of accentuated this before, who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or made weak. So again, if and when we put that spirit of charity that he talked about into practice, we'll find that it's not going to be that bad after all. You know, when Brother Ingalls was, or not Ingalls, Brother Larry uh, Owens was staying at her place, I didn't have a coffee either. I had tea with him. You know, I didn't get all, brother, you're a hypocrite because you're having tea and it has caffeine in it too. So, eh. So, I mean, just fine. We're not going to bake, we're, we're, while he was there, we're not, not going to make coffee. If he doesn't drink coffee, I'm not going to drink coffee in front of him. But he would always say, brother, go ahead. If you're going to, I don't care. I said, okay, thanks. I will. <laughs> So again, we can't put that stumbling block in front of our, 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 our brother or sister. Would the world come to an end if we had to go a couple days without a coffee? So, yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord, he's honest, amen. Driving down the road, you're wanting to stop for a coffee, and you're with one of your friends in the Lord, and you say, hey, there's a Tim Hortons up there, and they say, no, we're not going to Tim Hortons, let's go to McDonald's or somewhere else for coffee. And, and then all of a sudden, you got to, and we're not going anywhere but Tim Hortons. I mean, that, that, there's got to be a scripture verse for that somewhere, you know. And, you know. We can go to McDonald's or we can go to Starbucks. I'm sorry, I can't afford Starbucks. And uh, anyways, I, I haven't got time to wait in line either to spend all that money. But um, anyways, 
despite what some people might think, you know, you can put out that stogie, you can go without a cigar or without, without a coffee, you know, whatever it may be for a day. Or what, it, just don't offend your brother. Don't offend your sister. Don't, don't, don't cause, but he says that, that strife, but rather seek the peace and seek the joy and uh, let's all get along. If something is questionable, now, this is so important. If something is questionable, and this is something in my life, when I first was saved and then growing and even developing today, I'm still developing convictions, you know? There are certain things that, that I don't do that most Christians don't have problems with. Be certain things you do that other Christians do or whatever it may be, but my, my philosophy has always been, and I believe Paul is even telling us this philosophy is a good philosophy, and that is if it's questionable, if it's questionable, if you got even a handful of Christians, you know, in a good church that all believe that, that's probably something maybe you should just always err on the side of caution. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, it may not be something I would die for, but I mean, hey, listen, I can understand it, and you know, maybe, maybe it is best, it is right, it is scriptural, or whatever it may be. It's always better to err on the side of caution. Because when we err on the side of uh, liberalism, guess what? We're going to end up a liberal church. We're going to end up in liberalism. And finally, uh, number four, you guys came on the right Wednesday night because I normally don't have four points. I usually have three. In fact, I shouldn't say I got more than four points, but we're just going to have four tonight. And that is this, the faith factor. The faith factor. And we find that in verses 22 and 23. Hast thou faith? And uh, that's a good question. He goes on to say, Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Now, if you don't understand that verse, go home and read it a few times. Because it's really important that you understand what he's saying here. He asks, have you faith? And then he says, have it to thyself before God. In other words, what he's saying, if you have enough faith to be able to eat that meat, then just do it alone. And, and isn't that interesting how he calls a conviction faith here? But what we do, everything we do in the Christian life and every conviction we have is by faith. Everything is by faith. He said, you know, I, I'm going to, again, I, I talked about alcohol last week. You know, like I might be able to handle alcohol. I know I can. I was never a drunk. I did get drunk before I was saved once in a while, but I hated doing it. And for the most part, for the last years, before I got saved, I don't think I ever got drunk. I, I'd have a beer or I'd have a glass of wine, and I could handle it. I didn't have a problem. But you know, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ that can't. And, I, and that's what I decided. I believe wholeheartedly the Bible, 75 verses against alcoholic wine, fermented wine. That's enough for me. But even if it was more questionable than that, I would abstain from it because I don't want to be an offense to a brother that might cause them to stumble or, or push them back into, uh, uh, in, into that sin, into becoming a drunkard all over again. And so, uh, but I knew one brother, a good, very good friend of mine, and um, he, he grew up in Europe where drinking wine was like drinking water. At, at, at the meal and stuff and with the way he grew up in Portugal when you're four years old they give you wine for your meal it was just everybody did that he didn't have a problem with having a glass of wine uh, I, I know I know other Christians that use cooking sherry you know oh, all the alcohol gets cooked out of it you know whatever but but this one brother though he 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 didn't have a problem with a glass of wine at supper and he knew that most Christians were against that and so he would keep it very quiet and he would never, ever, ever, ever pull anything out of the cupboard when anyone was over. He did it by himself. He made sure that he wasn't going to ever offend anybody. And, and that's what he did. And, you know, I, I still pray for him. He's, he's back in Portugal now. And, uh, again, just using that as an example there. Now, all things in the Christian life are done by faith no matter what we do. And all things that we do, and even all of our convictions, and, and, and like I mentioned, alcohol, they're, they're all there for the benefit of other people. They're all there for the benefit of other, other people. 
So what you do and your convictions are for the benefit of other people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an illustration here. Now, I was talking about drinking and alcohol. The Bible says, and I'm going to use this as an illustration because I think most of us are aware of how our world is and feminism and all these things. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse the Bible says in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's what the Bible says, that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. And that's why here we make sure, you know, the women have knee-length skirts or dresses and, you know, they don't have, you know, low-cut tops. And, and by the way, you should be thankful that I'm really nice about this because, because I am. There was a preacher that I knew and uh, he, got, he got fed up. He said some of the ladies started wearing really low-cut tops, and he got up behind the pulpit one Sunday, and he says, we don't want to see your boobs. And I'll never say that, okay? I will never say that from the pulpit. But he did. And uh, anyways, it, it says that. Now, the Bible also says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, but I say also unto you, I know most of you were just shocked, weren't you? So was I. I didn't say it, though, remember that. Okay, the Bible also says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in, his, in their heart. Now, the, you know the world, feminism and everything says to you, uh, says, it, it says it doesn't matter how we dress. If you look at us wrong, that's your problem. How many people have heard that in society? There was a, uh, and again, I'm not going to say whether this was right or wrong. A few years ago, there was a, a woman who was raped and the police chief or someone, when they're being interviewed, said, ladies, cover up a little better. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Does anybody remember that? And then there was about 400 women that showed up in bikinis and all kinds of crazy stuff protesting because that police officer said that. You know, dress a little better. And so they were, they were, their, their argument was that we're going to dress however we want. And if you look at us the wrong way, then that is your problem. So are they being their brother's keeper? Absolutely not. Are we to be our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. So we are to be concerned about whether or not somebody stumbles or whether somebody, you know, somebody falls. So that's why it says that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in her heart. So a woman who has a conviction of modesty, she's doing that to cause to, 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 sorry, to make sure somebody else doesn't sin or somebody else doesn't stumble. And uh, that's just one example. Alcohol, I use that as another example. I'm not trying to pick on any areas here. Your conviction, simply put, is for the good of others so that they don't stumble. They're for the good of other people. And again, it's all a matter of faith. So we abstain from practices others find offensive, sinful, and we have convictions and standards Let's be patient with those who haven't been taught yet. No judging visitors when they come in. You know, people come in from the world, and guess what they're going to bring in with them? They're going to bring the world in. And that's why, you know, I'm not going to judge anyone that walks in here. I'm not going to judge any, anyone, uh, you know, because they've got some worldliness when they're coming out of the world or whatever. That's not what God wants. That's not what God says. We're not to argue and fight and debate because someone maybe isn't in the same place that you're in or come to a conviction that you've come to. And so, again, let's just make sure that we understand that all that we do is for the good of other people. And everything we do is, is, is faith. We do by faith, just believing God. So the bottom line, again, here is we have differences but no matter where you are on the scale of Christian piety and separation, we are above all else to seek peace. You can still love someone and get along with someone who maybe doesn't see eye to eye on small things, you know, issues, little quirky things. If you want to drink coffee, amen? If you don't want to drink coffee, you can, if you quit, just give me your coffee, amen? I'll, I'll take care of it for you. But anyways, I hope a blessing and a help to you. We'll pray and uh, then we'll have a closing song. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together tonight and uh, we thank you for the blessings of God. We thank you for all the goodness you've given to us and uh, may the Holy Spirit of God have his will and way as we think about the church, as we think about our need to get along with one another, to seek peace. We'll praise you, we'll thank you in Jesus' name and amen.
Let's stand again if you're able to. 497, search me, O oh God. tonight.